Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 6th regular meeting of council. I'd like to recognize that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with community charter and procedure bylaw 2018, number 7272. The question period sign-up sheet is by the, on the table by the double doors to my left for agenda items only. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and number uh, on the agenda, uh, on the sheet. Uh, members have been granted the authority to join us electronically, and I want to welcome Councillor Perino, who, Perino, who's with us tonight. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry, and we have several this evening. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. For late items this evening, agenda item 11B, Carolina Ibera, Ian Scott, Kayla Lilladale, or Lilladal from Pacific Housing regarding a letter of support from City of Nanaimo. So we're adding their correspondence as well, and that's agenda item 11B. Agenda item 11C, a delegation from David Brooks, board chair, Tinny Lally, development consultant, Bellinas Housing Society regarding a letter of support. Agenda item 12A, we're adding a report titled Nanaimo Fire and Rescue Medical Incident Cost Recovery. Agenda item 13, bylaws, add the following bylaws, zoning amendment bylaw 2023, number 4500, decimal 209, and highway closure and dedication removal bylaw 2023, number 7364, as well as a request um, that's not noted on your annotated from Woodgrove Senior Citizens Housing Society, seeking a letter of support from mayor and council for a, pro a proposed future um, proposal, building, project, under, and we'll add that, Your Worship, under item 15A, Other Business. Thank you very much. Motion for adoption of the agenda is amended. Moved Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Eastmere. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated. Moved Councillor Eastmere, seconded Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Uh, the Mayor's report tonight, I have a number of things to remind everybody about. Uh, the first is a reminder that the city is seeking applications for the 2024 social planning grants. Um, applications are now being accepted. A total of $85,000 is available under two separate grant categories. Community Vitality Grants, $25,000, and Social Response Grants, $60,000. Uh, this was announced several weeks ago, but I would remind everyone that the deadline for submitting applications is 12 p.m. on Tuesday, November 14th, uh, a week tomorrow. So I would encourage those organizations that are interested to apply. The work continues on the East Wellington Road and Midtown Water Supply Project. Uh, the Parkway overpass will be closed uh, to through traffic for several weeks as the project has to extend into November. Originally it had hoped that it would be completed in October, but the East Wellington section of the Midtown Water Supply Project has seen challenges and delays due to a significant amount of hard rock below the road surface where the new pipeline will be installed. Uh, so the timeline for this section has now been extended into December. So everyone try and observe the usual courtesies and please pay attention so that we can ensure that everyone working on the project is safe and the project can be completed as quickly as possible. Uh, the city is also uh, asking for uh, nominations for the 2024 Cultural Awards. Uh, the nominations are open with a deadline of January 28, 2024. There are three categories, excellence in culture, honor in culture, and emerging cultural leader, uh, someone under 30 years of age. Uh, you can visit the uh, Culture Awards page at www.nanaimo.ca. And again, January 28th, midnight 2024 is the close of nominations. Happy to uh, also uh, point out that we have a new temporary art project uh, that follows the dynamic changes of the Millstone River. Curtis Grower's temporary art project, Millstone Unveiled in Bowen Park. Uh, visitors will be uh, immersed, uh, be able to immerse themselves in a new temporary public art project revolving around the Millstone. Uh, Parks, Recreation and Culture recently unveiled local artist Curtis Grower's temporary art project. Uh, it's an interactive media project. Uh, it consists of six films accessed using personal devices and QR codes that can be found on signs located throughout the park, strategically placed following the path of the river. Millstone can also be accessed online at https 
uh, semicolon double slash millstonefilm.ca where vi visitors can find an interactive map illustrating sign locations. In addition, uh, an artist talk with Mr. Grauer discussing the Millstone project will take place on Saturday, December the 2nd at 2 p.m. at the Black Rabbit Kitchen in the Attic as part of Nanaimo Art Walk 2023. The city is also seeking feedback on accessibility and inclusion. Uh, we're inviting residents uh, on matters related to accessibility and inclusion to uh, submit their, their comments. The online form can be found on the city website. Individuals who may need assistance ac accessing the form are welcome to submit their feedback over the phone by calling 250-755-4460, extension 4547. And again, more information can be found on the city website. Uh, very pleased to uh, announce in conjunction with the Regional District Nanaimo that the City and the Regional District have been awarded a grant to support uh, a Woodgrove Area Complete Community. Uh, the City of Nanaimo in partnership with the Regional District have been awarded a $200,000 Complete Communities Grant to fund an assessment in support of the Woodgrove Area becoming a complete community. The funding is provided by the BC Ministry of Housing and administered by the Union of BC Municipalities to support local governments in the creation of more complete communities. A complete community uh, is one that provides a diversity of housing and a wide range of employment opportunities, amenities, and transportation services. Uh, pursuant to our city plan, Nanaimo reimagined, uh, uh, that identified Woodgrove Urban Centre as one of the seven urban centres envisioned to become complete communities and where the majority of the city's future growth will be focused. Uh, that concludes uh, my report. Uh, we have a rise in report, uh, Ms. Gurry, from the in-camera council meeting on October the 16th. And at that time, um, Councillor uh, Eastmere was appointed as the member uh, and Councillor Brina as the alternate uh, for uh, a one-year term on the Design Advisory Panel. It's very interesting work. I think Councillor Eastmere is very pleased. It's a wonderful way to learn about how projects come to fruition in this community and what they look like as we take into account uh, public views about appearance, which is incredibly important. Now we come to a very happy part of the... Well, no, I have one more thing to say. Um, I would remind everyone that Saturday, November the 11th is Remembrance Day. Uh, and many of you uh, tonight are wearing poppies, uh, recognizing the significance of that day uh, and honoring those who have served this country uh, in times of war, in times of peace, peacekeeping missions, uh, and recognizing uh, the many deaths that have occurred uh, over that period of time in, that nation, in this nation's history. I hope that all of you will take the time on November the 11th to pause uh, for a minute of silence wherever you may be, whether you're at the ceremonies or not. Uh, to recognize how grateful we must all be uh, to live in what is still a very peaceable kingdom in a peaceable part of the world in contrast to the sad state of affairs that exist in so many parts of the world. I think particularly of the people of Ukraine uh, fighting to maintain their very na nation uh, in the midst of a very powerful and aggressive neighbor. Uh, so as we... Uh, gather, and as we think about this on November the 11th, uh, let us give thanks uh, to those who have served and continue to serve uh, this country. Now, on to presentations. Um, I and Merrill Heinz, who uh, with, is with the Public Works Association of BC, uh, have uh, some awards and some good news. Uh, Ms. Heinz, uh, welcome. Much, uh, much appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you, thank you, Council, Mayor. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm Meryl Hines. I'm the president of the Public Works Association of British Columbia, um, but I'm also the roads management specialist at the city of Nanaimo. Um, the Public Works Association of BC represents individuals working for municipalities, utility companies, and engineering firms in every community in British Columbia and the Yukon. Its members are dedicated to improving the quality of life for its citizens. PWABC is a chapter of the American Public Works Association, and it exists to service its members by providing uh, opportunities for mutual support, education, and professional development. PWABC has an awards program that highlights individuals and projects that go above and beyond professional duties. This year, the city of Nanaimo was awarded three awards at the annual Public Works Conference in Penticton. 
Project of the Year, Emerging Leader, and Outstanding Public Works Employee. Project of the Year is awarded to a municipality which constructs a major public works or utility project which deserves special merit because of its unique features or complexity relative to the resources of the community. The emerging leader recognizes and encourages young leaders within the public works sector in British Columbia. This award acknowledges the efforts and contributions to young leaders within their organizations and their communities. And the outstanding public works employee recognizes someone's overall value to their organization, including outstanding achievements, innovations, improvements to the community, community service, and participation in organizations. It's a special event for me tonight, as I am proud to honor the award winners as the president of the Public Works Association. But I'm also truly humbled to be able to say that I am a colleague of two outstanding employees who make a difference to the lives of the residents of Nanaimo every day. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, read uh, three separate uh, documents that uh, outline the extensive service uh, that uh, relates to the employees and, uh, and to the city as well. Um, and in due course, I will call each of them down individually, uh, please, to receive the award and the, uh, the, the usual photo op and the circumstances. And then at the end, please, a photo op with all three, including Ms. Heinz. Uh, who has brought her lovely 11-month-old with her as well. <laughs> a baby to kiss, it's a politician's dream. Uh, the first is the Outstanding Public Works Employee, and uh, that is going to be awarded to Mike Anderson, who is a supervisor of construction projects. He has nearly 20 years of experience, including 10 years leading a very highly motivated and proficient construction crew. I am told that his leadership style character is characterized by openness and inclusivity, coupled with profound knowledge and practical experience, and thereby empowering his crew to excel in tackling complex tasks with competence. Uh, his approachable demeanor fosters respect and admiration within the public works community and has earned him high praise from both unionized personnel and management, as well as positive feedback from suppliers, contractors, and very importantly, the public. Uh, beyond his role as a crew supervisor, Mike's comprehensive understanding of public works makes him a sought-after advisor, often providing valuable mentorship to employees in new positions. Uh, his unique abilities, unwavering integrity, and reliability distinguish him as an exceptional team player and leader, making him stand out in the field of public works management. Why don't you just stand up so everyone can see you at least. Thank you. Uh, the next is Michael Olson, Assistant Supervisor in the Storm Drainage Unit, who is the Emerging Leader of the Year. Uh, he joined the Public Works Department almost 20 years ago and has gone on a progressive journey from laborer to Assistant Supervisor of Drainage while demonstrating a thirst for knowledge and always looking to increase his skills while also mentoring others. He has a gift with the public, turning negative interactions into positive ones, a lesson all politicians could take. Uh, by clearly listening to their concerns and explaining the work he and his team are doing to help solve their problems. Public Works Week celebrations would not have been the same without him, as his enthusiasm for public works rubs off on the local school children, gaining him many thank you letters. For those of you who have uh, swam off the beaches of Nanaimo, you have uh, Mike and his team to thank as part of their work on the beach water sampling team is to keep people informed and safe. Uh, his passion for sharing knowledge extends past the office into the community, however, where he can be found volunteering as a hockey, power skating, and baseball coach. Now, he's a fairly modest guy, so I'm going to embarrass him only a little bit by saying this. Uh, he's also, and was the pride of Nanaimo, being the captain, all-star, and champion of the R Nanaimo Clippers team, and was with the organization from 2002 to 2005, leading his team to the Hockey League Championship. Uh, referred to as a great ambassador for the game in our city, city, he later returned to the organization as an assistant coach and assistant general manager. And his volunteer work in the city is con and the fact that he has chosen public service, his career is consistent with that com commitment to public service. And he is here with his whole family tonight. <laughs> and finally, the project of the year. Sometimes uh, the underground servicing projects that are engaged in 
can be finished off in a lovely way so that people think we spend a lot of money building a trail when in fact we've accomplished a, wonder, a wonderful underground project and topped it with a trail. The Bowen Park upgrade, um, span, in Bowen Park spanning 36 hectares, underwent significant upgrades including utility and trailway improvements. The Millstone Trunk Sewer, servicing 40% of Nanaimo, required upsizing due to the rapid growth of the city, something we are all very conscious of. The upgrade involved 925 meters of sanitary trunk sewer, uh, which had to be increased from 600 millimeters to 900 millimeters in diameter, widening of the path and installation of pedestrian lighting. Seismic con design considerations were crucial, especially on the steep slopes, and if those of you who've been in Bowen Park, you know where I speak. The project was completed under budget at $3,573,881, thanks to both careful monitoring and collaboration with the contractors. Construction by milestone equipment contracting was completed without any safety incidents and innovative methods and minimized the environmental impact, working in one of the most sensitive and publicly accessible and noticeable areas of our community. Public consultation and environmental preservation were priorities uh, with measures taken to protect wildlife and minimize tree removal. The project resulted in a popular and resilient trailway, but it also uh, doubling its use post-construction, but provided enhanced sewer capacity for Nanaimo's future, a very crucial function of our public works department. So it's not inappropriate, I think, to uh, suggest a round of applause for the winners tonight, even though we're supposed to be so decorous here in council. So, if I may, Mike, Meryl. Nothing more fun than a happy event and rewarding people to work hard for their community. And the baby was just too perfect for words. Uh, we have uh, committee minutes there to, for receipt, no motion required. Uh, we have a motion for adoption of the, I'd call for a motion for adoption of the consent items, but we want 10C dealt with separately. So this is 10A and 10B. Moved, Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Eastmere. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And then the separately addressed consent items, uh, Ms. Gurry, uh, staff has uh, requested that we separate it into two separate motions. Yes, Your Worship, if the motion that is at the end there that says 
that council direct staff to allocate the growing communities fund monies to the following projects as part of the 2024 to 2028 financial plan but above it um, that motion needs to be considered as well and that is a change for the commercial street design project to be moved from the 2024 budget to the 2023 financial plan and amend that financial plan so that the work can start this year and not wait until next year so if the the one if the whole um, motion is moved and seconded and if there's any discussion I believe Ms. Mercer is here and she could help answer any questions that you might have but that is the recommendation thank you very much Councillor Armstrong moves the recommended motion seconded Councillor Eastmere discussion anyone not seeing any all those in favor any opposed motion carries well, Councillor Brown opposed, thank you. Motion carries. Uh, the next we have delegations unrelated to agenda items, uh, three in a row. Uh, everyone's entitled to five minutes. When you get down to one minute, I will let you know. Uh, and I would ask firstly, uh, Michael Basili. I hope I pronounced it correctly or close enough, Basili. Somebody's gonna tell me, uh, Strong Towns Nanaimo. Uh, good evening, thanks for coming. Thanks for having us. And uh, for the slides. Perfect, thank you. Um, your Worship Council, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Michael Basili. I'm the co-founder and uh, organizer of Strong Towns in IMO. Um, today I just wanna go over kind of uh, what our organization stands for, our goals, our core tenets, and just kind of talk a little bit about us. So at its core, uh, Strong Towns and Nanaimo represents um, a paradigm shift in urban design uh, where we value uh, people-oriented places over automobile-oriented development. Uh, that means we envision a Nanaimo where people can come and do business and succeed, uh, where municipal finances aren't uh, uh, stretched beyond their means, where everyone is healthy and safe on the streets, uh, where people uh, can live within an environmentally conscious way and lastly, where housing is inherently affordable to all who live in Nanaimo. Um, at, you know, in, at its crux, uh, Strong Towns Nanaimo envisions um, a paradigm shift where we can undo the last roughly 50 years of auto-oriented suburban development uh, that has resulted in expensive housing, dangerous streets that are often overbuilt, and financially stretched municipal coffers. We are, as you can see, a grassroots organization. Uh, we are uh, just local citizens. Uh, we're not bankrolled by anyone. Uh, we don't even have bank accounts. Uh, we're just passionate citizens here, um, you know, advocating for our cause. So when I mention um, strong town, so what is a strong town? Um, a strong town is one that uh, promotes inclusive mixed use zoning, so an efficient use of land. Um, a strong town uh, reduces low density suburban sprawl, which stretches municipal uh, finances, um, having to maintain um, infrastructure that sprawls outwards. Um, for only a small subset of homes, uh, stretches the municipal finances um, quite dearly, as I'm sure if you've seen the uh, finance reports, so you're surely well aware. Um, a strong town is also one that invests in transportation wisely, so not just auto-oriented uh, transportation, but cycling, public transit, uh, sidewalks. These kind of pay dividends in the community when, you, when they're built. Uh, and lastly, a strong town is one that uh, builds vibrant, accessible public spaces. But all of this is under the umbrella of opposing primarily auto-oriented development. This is a pattern that we've uh, done in Nanaimo for roughly five decades. So we have uh, four kind of core tenets uh, at Strong Towns Nanaimo. Our first, as I mentioned before, is the opposition of auto-oriented development patterns. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Nanaimo has essentially subsidized um, car owners for five decades uh, at the expense, the direct expense of people who walk, cycle, and take public transit. Um, uh, it costs the city a lot of money to maintain infrastructure to far-flung suburbs, and the more we build, the more our municipal finances are stretched. Um, the second uh, is to educate the public on safe street design and advocate towards complete streets. So Nanaimo's OCP uh, is excellent, we're big fans, and Metro Drive's Complete Street is a perfect example of how you can remediate an overbuilt, dangerous strode, as they're called, a street road hybrid, um, into a safe street for the community where people can walk and take different modes of transportation. They, don't, they, they can drive, but they have um, options avail to, available to them. It's a more equitable way of building a community, and it, uh, pay, like I said before, pays dividends, as 
um, if you've seen the building permits on Metro uh, since the completion of that project, um, I'm sure you're all well aware, um, spurs development from the community. Um, third is pr the promotion of community housing and land for community benefit. So I'm talking about cooperative housing. We want to see Nanaimo uh, reach out and engage with local co-op housing groups uh, to build um, parcels, accessible public spaces that cannot be sold for profit. And finally, we want to advocate for an uh, increased public transit investment um, by the city. So things like the transit exchange downtown are perfect examples of projects that, um, as I said this a bunch of times, pay dividends. Um, they generate wealth within our community. They connect people to where they want to go. They reduce our reliance on cars. And they connect communities across all of Nanaimo. Um, any public transportation um, project in town that's, uh, that's built. One minute. Thank you. Um, any public transportation project that's built um, is a net win for Nanaimo, as far as we're concerned. So lastly, I just kind of want to leave you on this. Everyone in Nanaimo deserves to live in an affordable, equitable, and financially secure, resilient city. Uh, so decades of auto-oriented development have left their mark on Nanaimo, leading to financially um, stretched coffers, as well as unsafe, unpleasant public spaces. So at the bottom there is our website, our contact email. I just want to thank um, your worship council for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, under time as well. Any questions from council members? Yeah. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. <laughs> Sit coffee all over the place. Um, thank you for taking an interest in all this and, and supplying that. Um, one of the big things on our Facebook sites right now and people are talking about is the 15 minute concept, which they don't understand. Um, is that a concept that is supported by, by strong towns and can you please explain yes or no, or, or your rationale for whether you support it? Absolutely. Um, so uh, through your worship counselor. Um, so the 15 minute city, like the name has kind of been uh, co-opted, I guess, um, you know, in nasty ways. We, I think we prefer uh, the complete communities concept, which um, uh, uh, your worship has mentioned before. Um, but the concept is sound, yes, uh, being able to walk around, um, having amenities and shops and housing all kind of within reach, um, reducing your reliance on cars. That, that's kind of the crux of what a 15 minute city or complete city or com complete community is kind of... Um, towards yeah and it would be it'd be fair to say that it would also allow people to age in home a lot easier absolutely yes uh, so a big part a uh, big issue with suburban cell development is um, when uh, they you know, people get, you get injured or have they kind of age out uh, they're often forced to go to homes um, because they, they're not able to drive anymore they're not able to access their the routine services um, so the kind of um, a benefit of, of you know even small density improvements is that people can age in place and they can still remain in their homes thank you very much thank you counselor legally drive. Absolutely, yes, and also for young people who um, currently cannot afford housing, um, the density helps with that as well. Thank you. <laughs> My last point. Go. Sorry, and go also, ahead. I hope that you uh, bring it to the RDN as the RDN is responsible for transportation in the city, not the city, we, and we do advocate. Um, there's a few of us that are on there that are pushing for more us, bus hours, but it would be great to have that uh, presentation there as well. Absolutely, thank yes, thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thanks, Your Worship, uh, through you. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. And I'm just curious, uh, what type of, are, are you holding things for the public, like public education opportunities and things in the future, or kind of what's the future plans for, for your, your organization? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, through Your Worship, Councillor, uh, we've uh, held a few uh, presentations, lecture series um, uh, prior to this meeting uh, about like suburban sprawl, the financial impacts. Um, the benefits of density, and we have more of those down the pipeline as well. And on our website, we routinely uh, publish uh, our articles related to topics such as these. Um, so we uh, do try to engage with the community at that level to kind of educate the public. And we appear at like urbanist um, events. Uh, most recently, we were at the, um, the Urban Film Festival at VIU um, just last week, um, and we kind of set our piece. Uh, but we were preaching to the choir when there was already kind of on board um, with those topics. Um, but yeah. Great. Instagram and Facebook last night. Yes, we're getting there. So if, if folks want to find out more, though, that's the website. That's uh, yeah, beautifulnanaimo.ca. Right. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. And thank you. That was um, Strong Towns Nanaimo. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Oh, and yeah. Uh, that's it for questions from council members. Thank you so very much for making the presentation tonight. Appreciate your time. Thank, thank, you, thank you so you. much. Uh, the next uh, presentation and delegation is uh, Carolina Ibarra, Ian Scott, Kayla Lilladal, uh, development consultant, uh, respecting Pacifica Housing. Our Mr. Scott, I'm going to assume. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Carolina uh, should be on online, um, uh, joining us uh, by Zoom as well. I will give it a second for. 
I'm here. If everyone can hear me. There we are. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having us. So um, I can't see the presentation exactly on the screen, so I'm going to follow through my own screen and then hopefully we'll all match up. So your worship. Right. Uh, we will start now and at, at one minute, when there's one minute left, I will let you know. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to make sure I don't take too long. Thank you. Um, your Worship uh, Council, thank you so much for your time uh, today. My name is Carolina. I'm CEO of Pacifica Housing, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Ian Scott, who's our Director of Community Real Estate. Today we're here to chat with you uh, about a proposal that we are going to submit to BC Housing for funding um, to partially redevelop 309 Hillcrest Avenue, um, and we would like to request a letter of support for Council. Um, so I'll just start for anyone who's not aware um, on the next slide. Uh, just a little bit about Pacifica. We're one of Vancouver Island's largest providers of affordable housing and supportive services. Uh, I'm going to fly through this section, but uh, there's quite a bit of detail if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about us. So next uh, slide, Ian. Um, we, as I mentioned, we operate in a number of communities, primarily in Greater Victoria uh, and Nanaimo. Um, and as you'll see in the next slide, we provide, oh, one before, we provide a range of housing across the housing continuum. Um, we do not provide shelters, but we do provide everything from transitional housing to market rental housing and everything in between. Uh, and then the last piece of who we are is that we provide supportive services to people across the continuum, whether they are currently homeless or as someone who is in market rental housing but is struggling to pay their rent or running into other health issues, we provide supports. Um, and on to the topic of today. So, um, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Ian to go over the details of the project. Uh, thank you, Carolina, your worship council. Thank you for having us here uh, this evening. So we're looking uh, for your support for our proposal to the Community Housing Fund to redevelop 309 Hillcrest, which is a property we own uh, that currently has 34 units in townhouse buildings. Our proposal uh, takes this existing site that's in a already designated mixed use corridor and zoned for higher density than we have and does a phased relocation where half the units will be retained and half of them are redeveloped into a 78 unit four story building uh, with surface parking. The Community Housing Fund is a fund from BC Housing that supports independent rental housing, which is what we have on site already. And in that fund, it's a mixed, uh, mixed model of 20% deep subsidy units, 50% rent geared to income, so the lower income households at 30% of their income, and 30% are market units rented to moderate income households. It's a great site because of that existing designation, existing zoning, but also because we're here in the city of Nanaimo, there's a big demand as well as you have strong supportive policies like your 50% DCC reduction, which helps the bottom line of our proposal. We definitely are at earlier stages of the design development. Uh, this is just an illustration uh, of what we're proposing. Uh, the new building closer to Foster Street, three of those townhouses removed. Uh, those tenants then get relocated within our portfolio as well as working with other nonprofit partners so they end up in similar housing uh, that they're in now. Two of the buildings get removed at the end of construction and those tenants moved into the new building and then the parking and landscaping, which is obviously very crudely illustrated here tonight, but um, is, then, um, uh, you know, is then constructed at the last minute. Um, and then we still have half of the units uh, retained um, and uh, we house more people uh, in, our, in our community and in, uh, I think fair to say, your community. And Carolina is gonna finish us off. Here. Thank you, Ian. So yes, in conclusion, um, what we're seeking from um, Your Worship and Council is a letter of support for the application as the property is already zoned for the proposed use, uh, indicating in the letter measures that the city has already taken to promote housing, as well as any willingness to work with Pacifica to identify options for additional city of Nanaimo financial supports would be wonderful. The why of the request is that a successful application is the first step to developing 
uh, more detailed design and then move through the development permit process. So this letter um, is with the acknowledgement that we still would need to move through that permit process um, if successful. A high volume of submissions are expected from across the province uh, and municipal support will increase uh, chances of success for Pacifica and anyone else uh, who's presenting to you tonight. And considering Nanaimo's housing need, the region is has become a, a priority for Pacifica because we want to do everything that we can to bring more affordable units to the Nanaimo community that so needs it. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Th thank you very much and almost exactly on time. Uh, any questions from Council? Councillor Perino. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick questions. I just wondered if you could just explain for us once again about, so half of half of the townhouses that are currently there will be uh, torn down and, and rebuilt. What happens to the people that are in those during the construction phases? I will defer to my colleague Ian for, for detail, uh, but in summary, it's a phased relocation to minimize impact, uh, but Ian can provide more detail. Yeah, so so part of that start started today, a letter to our tenants, you know, letting them know that we're thinking of this, and as we get closer to construction, we then work with the tenants in the existing units um, to understand what their housing needs are. We look at what they're currently paying, and then we work to relocate them for within a period of about eight months in advance of construction uh, into other units within our portfolio. We have uh, four different independent housing sites across Nanaimo, as well as working with some of the other folks in the room, like the Bolinas Housing Society and others, so that by the time we get to construction, the people impacted are, are moved to new housing. Um, and then some of the people stay during construction and some of them get moved then at the end of construction into the new building. So it's really working with tenants to try to um, to accommodate that move process into new suitable accommodation if their units are gonna be torn down. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And one more question, if I might, uh, Your Worship. I'm just wondering, who is the one who evaluates? Is, is it Pacifica that does the evaluation of whether or not a tenant, you know, what their affordability um, is? Or like, how does that, is that done by BC Housing or is it done by Pacifica? I'm just wondering how that works. Uh, that's an excellent question. So that is something that Pacifica assesses uh, and there are certain uh, developments or other existing projects that have subsidies from BC Housing and have certain income requirements. And so we would first uh, measure or evaluate the income of the resident, which we do every year at the site anyway, because it's a subsidized site, and then find another subsidized location for them. If some people have, you know, families where their children are older and moving out, then we uh, evaluate their income differently and try to find something suitable for them at that point. So we do have a mix of market and uh, subsidized housing. I suspect most of the residents at Pacific Court will require subsidized housing, and that's what we yes. will be seeking for them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Council Prino. Any other questions? Uh, not seeing any, uh, let me just, on behalf of Council, express our thanks for the presentation, but also for your interest in increasing the desperately needed supply of affordable housing in our community. Uh, so, uh, as much as I will say tonight at this point, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next is uh, David Brooks, Board Chair, and Tinny Lally, Development Consultant from the Bolinas Housing Society. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. Um, five minutes, I'll let you know when you've got a minute left. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, David Brooks, I'm Chair of the Bolinas Housing Society and with me is Mr. Lally, our design consultant. Uh, we're here tonight to ask for two letters of support for the city for two projects that we're pursuing currently. Um, as our, the previous speakers, we're, uh, we're putting in uh, a request with BC Housing for funds. Uh, the call for funding, uh, or the Proposals have to be in before the end of this month. So we're looking for uh, letters of support on fairly short notice. Uh, one is with respect to what we call our trackside property, which is on Perdoe Street, uh, just one off of Comox Road, right behind the property we own at 610 Comox. Uh, we're looking to replace those uh, rental units with uh, more substantial development. 
Um, and we just want a, a letter of support from the city for that. The second one is, is more involved. Uh, that's with respect to the butter tubs property. Um, I'm sure council's familiar with the 10 butter tubs uh, building that we opened last year um, with 154 units for seniors housing. We also own the property across the street uh, at 11 butter tubs and 15 butter tubs. And we're looking to uh, develop those in, in the near future, uh, specifically 11 butter tubs to start. 15 butter tubs will be in, in the uh, further in the future. The um, 11 butter tubs property, uh, we require uh, a request, a letter from the city um, supporting that and also committing to extending the water mains from Bowen Road to that property. Uh, my understanding is uh, that that commitment is already in the works for 2030, but city staff are in favor of moving it up um, to accommodate our development if it goes ahead. Um, and in exchange for that, uh, we're uh, prepared to give a statutory right away to the city to develop a, um, a pathway through the property bisecting 11 and 15 butter tubs that, and then there'll be a bridge across the millstone, I understand, to access uh, for city bikeways and, and that type of thing. Um, so we're here to do some horse trading, I guess, and, and ask for the letter of commitment from, from the city in support of that development so that we can proceed to request funding from BC Housing. Well, I think that uh, pretty uh, captures the things that we're looking for. Uh, of particular interest to us is actually the bike lane to go with this. Come close to the mic, please. We, we, uh, we're, when we first started this project, we were looking at it as a master plan for the entire community. And one of the things that we really liked was the idea of a bike lane, a, si a safe way around the area over the Millstone River and connecting to apparently another bike lane on the other side. So that was a very important component for the society and has been very keen on wanting to work with the city uh, to uh, expand that bike lane. And it would be over an existing, uh, there's a, a, a sanitary main that the city has underneath that roadway right now. We would extend the uh, the, the right of way to the top so people could cross over it. Uh, in addition, there would have to be a bit of a right of way over portion of the river as portion of the river actually belongs to 11 and 15 um, butter tubs. So not would it just not go down between the two, but it would actually have to go in front of 11 and across the waterway. So that's what we're looking for as kind of a community contribution. The only thing I would add to that, Your Worship, is that uh, um, we would need unfettered uh, access to the right-of-way during construction of both development sites uh, when we go ahead with them. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You've got a minute left, but we've got some questions already. Councillor Armstrong, please. Uh, thank you. Um, when, when the last phase went in, my phone lit up by a lot of seniors that were really concerned because their rents went up. So you, you've got here that 20% will stay at the subsidy rental, 50 be geared to income, and then the other 30. Is there a guarantee that that will happen? Yes, it has to. The BC Housing uh, grants uh, and mortgages that we obtain dictate the, um, the, the specific amounts for the specific uh, uh, percentages and rents that we're allowed to charge. And then would, would that apply to those that are already there first and then you would look at new residents coming in? Yes, yes, of course. And, and in any displaced residents, uh, we have the ability through our portfolio to relocate them during construction. Thank you. And, and thank you for, for the bike lane. That's the type of bike lanes I like to see when they're totally removed from traffic and you can move throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Appreciate your time and the work of the Housing Society. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Brown? I just had a question, uh, Your Worship. Um, we do have the new business portion under our agenda, um, but I just saw two agencies with yeah. three projects requesting uh, letters of support, and I'm just, would that be the appropriate time? Or would you? I think under new business, yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, the next item is reports, the Nanaimo Fire and Rescue Medical Incident Cost Recovery.
Your Worship, I was just going to suggest either um, dealing with it arising from delegations or waiting until other business after you hear from the third, um, I think there's an, yet another request um, under other business that we've added as late item. So um, dealing with, with it under other business is fine as well. Thank you. Yeah. Chief Doyle, good evening. The floor good, is yours. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Thanks for having, having me here tonight to speak uh, to you about this issue. Um, just to, to start off with, in terms of the report, um, NFR has been providing pre-hospital care for decades, which is not uncommon in the United States and Canada. It's a, quite a common model. However, it is a um, responsibility of the provincial government under the Emergency Health Act. Um, our time uh, uh, providing first responder services dates back officially uh, into the early 90s. And even before, um, and that's... Uh, coincidentally, when the first responder program was formed by the province. Um, however, our, our, we even go back farther than that to more low acuity type of calls. So, uh, but we've been responding robustly for the last, over the last three decades. Um, and that's provided, give, the council has the ability to pro provide those services under the community charter. So, um, in 2019, just to, we, uh, council approved uh, enhancing our services to the emergency medical responder level. So that uh, program is uh, scheduled to complete in 2025. It started in 2019. We're doing it in a phased approach every year. Um, to be clear, that we don't respond to all medical calls at, this, at the current time. We respond to high acuity calls. So, um, so immediate life-threatening uh, or time-critical calls. So... Um, where we do respond to low acuity calls is when BCS is delayed. So if BCS is delayed, then dispatch will um, dispatch us to low acuity calls. Um, just to give you a breakdown, in 2022, we responded to 9,872 9, incidents. 50% were medical and 43% were non-medical, all our other types of calls, fires, motor vehicle accidents, hazmat calls, technical rescues, and the like. Um, in the period dating from January 1st to now, uh, well, to August 31st, we had responded to 8,060 incidents, 5,388 were medical calls, and 2,672 were non-medical calls which works out to be about 68% and 32 were spent respectively. There, is, there has been a jump. Um, that can pretty squarely be attributed to the illicit drug crisis. What we've seen is um, we're seeing a, a huge increase in illicit drug use calls overdoses. So in 2017, we responded to 462 just to kind of look in the rear view mirror and work our way forward. In 2018, we responded to 458. 2019, 337. 2020, now we're kind of going, actually I should add that in 2018, there were some changes to the critical response model in the province that um, also resulted in us, all, all fire departments across BC going to less incidents, medical incidents. So you do see a little bit of a drop between 2018, they were implemented about halfway through the year. And then moving on to 2019, we went to 337. 2020, we're moving into COVID. Um, so we have a, the critical response model and COVID simultaneously impacting the types of calls we're going to in terms of overdo overdoses. So we went down to 271. In 2021, emerging from um, COVID, uh, and there's obviously other factors in this, but we, th we responded to 507 overdoses. In 2022, there's uh, a, an increase to 672. And just this year, I just checked today, um, just to give you an updated number from the report, we we're up to 1,500 overdoses. That was as of today um, at approximately 4 o'clock. So in terms of medical calls increasing, the increase in our medical calls um, is a large chunk of that is due to the illicit drug uh, crisis. Um, yeah, so if at the current pace, uh, in terms of incidents, last year, if we responded to 9,872, 9, in total this year, we should finish the year somewhere just around 12,000 incidents. 
So, and if you're looking at our calls in terms of the jump from 672 and overdoses to 1500 already this year, um, you know, that's a big chunk of the increase of our calls. So just moving on here a little bit further. In terms of what we talked about earlier, high acuity and low acuity incidents, low acuity incidents um, in 2022 made, made up 792 incidents. Um, in terms of cost to respond to, to low acuity in, incidents based on that number, um, we worked with finance and came up with, because um, we talked about the, all the costs to respond. So we, we've tallied that in a way that it's wages, met first responders supplies, and fuel for the vehicles to get to and from the incidents, wear and tear on the vehicles, maintenance and fuel. Um, for low acuity incidents, not including wages in 2022, so that's the 792 incidents. That would have been a pro well, it would have been $21,354. If we include wages, that figure goes up to just over $80,000. Um, in terms of the total cost to respond to medical calls, all the medical calls that NFR responds to in 2022, um, that cost would be about 591,954, including wages. Um, excluding wages, $153,927. You may ask why I'm including wages and excluding wages. Um, the reason is, is that the fire department exists for a number of reasons. At the, at the moment, it's, we do medical calls, we do hazmat calls, we do fires, we do wildfires, we do technical rescue, um, motor vehicle accidents, assistance calls. Basically, if there's an emergency in the community, the fire department responds to that. So the way that medical incidents in the past have been viewed is that because the fire department exists to respond to all those hazards, by adding the medical calls, it, it, it's almost on a, a value added basis that you have a fire department um, that exists for all other hazards and this strengthens public safety by uh, responding to medical calls. I think it's a, it's a, well, I don't think, it's a very common model across North America and, and Canada. So it's, um, it's a way to strengthen public safety with the resources we have in our community. Um, I think in terms of our, in terms of, when we think of looking through the front windshield and into the future, uh, we're anticipating our calls continue to grow with the community growing. Um, and. I would have to unfortunately say that with the illicit drug crisis, it doesn't seem to be, at least by our numbers, um, slowing. Uh, I would anticipate community growth and the illicit drug crisis, amongst other factors, to continue to drive our calls um, upwards in the future. Um, at the moment, in the province, there's no real mechanism to bill back the province for the cost of medical calls for fire, fire departments. In 2004, uh, 2004, Surrey at the Union of British Columbia Municipalities put forward a, a resolution that was endorsed um, to try to recover some of those costs for medical calls. And again, in 2023, Prince George has put forth a similar motion that you can see in the report with the same goal in mind to recover some of the, some of the costs for medical calls. Um, so in terms of the options uh, council has, to recover costs for medical calls, I think soliciting the provincial government is uh, definitely a good first step for the for our community. Um, I'll, if, you, if anyone has any questions, thank you very much, Chief Doyle, uh, Councillor Brown, and then Councillor Armstrong. Oh, thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, thank you for your report. You know, I was going to withdraw my request for it after I saw the UBCM motion, but I think it's important that people understand. Since the government has actually started to put a push to get more paramedics out onto the street, have you noticed, has there been a decline in actual medical calls like heart attacks, et cetera, versus overdose and illicit drugs? A decline in, call, sorry, through uh, your worship, Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, like a decline where you're going to like broken legs, heart attacks, et cetera, with the, with the increased paramedics? Because my understanding is we're very short on paramedics and then the government had there's, there's been an influx of more. Has that made a difference in the type of calls that you're going to where you're spending more time on illicit drug overdose? Um, through your worship, Councillor Armstrong, I don't know. I don't have that data in front of me. I mean, I can and try to 
uh, go back and, and figure out a way to report back on that. But I think what it what it has done because um, Nanaimo has seen some strengthening of BC at British Columbia Ambulance Services uh, staffing. Um, I think what it has does is that in Nanaimo we're not experiencing some of the the, the really long delays in terms of being on scene without BCAS. So, um, and why that's important is because the fire department doesn't transport patients to the, to the hospital and once we make patient contact, we can't leave the patient. So um, if, the, if there's not enough resource, uh, BC ambulance resources in the community, when we get a, go to a call, if they can't respond in a timely manner, it means we're tied up tending to a patient, waiting for them to come take the patient and transport them. So, um, so as, a, as compared to where there, there is a, there, you know, we saw that in the heat dome and we saw it afterwards. Um, and I do know some departments that have um, completely turned off uh, low acuity incidents so that they're not tied up at those low acuity calls. Um, and that's mainly not to be tied up um, at a low acuity call if another emergency comes in where their resources are, are uh, a higher priority, greater need. And just one follow-up. Um, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's Winnipeg is now looking at a model of a combined uh, fire department with paramedics. Would, would that uh, be more beneficial? And then they, they also have like the vehicle that will transport because they are as trained paramedics. Through your worship, Councillor Armstrong, I would have to take that yeah, away not a problem. and, and put more consideration to it. Thank it's, you so much for the report. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Perino, please. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, through you, a, question, a couple of questions for Chief Doyle. And just want to say, first of all, excellent report, of course, and, uh, you know, the work you do it just can't be understated how important it is. So my first question is, uh, from 20, uh, 2022, you had uh, 672 medical calls. I believe that's the term you used. And then in 2023, right up until uh, today, you've, you're at 1,500. I'm wondering if you would happen to know, Chief Doyle, how many um, how many patients that is, because my understanding is that you do see patients, some of the same patients, uh, a, a number of times. So I'm just wondering, is that 1,500 patients or is that 700 patients? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Through your worship, Councillor Perino, it's a good question, um, and you're correct. We do sometimes respond to the same patient even sometimes twice in one day it's, it's not all the time but it's definitely not um, necessarily uncommon i don't have that data in front of me uh, council perino in terms of how many of the 1500 overdoses so far and remember uh, i know uh, just to be clear that's 1500 overdoses in, in 2023 so far versus 672 overdoses um, i don't have uh, the numbers on how many of those are the same person in front of me? So. Well, and the reason that I asked the question is, you know, we met with the Minister of, uh, of Addictions and, you know, when you see numbers this high and you see that they possibly might be um, not 1,500 people, but uh, some people having multiple incidences, you realize more than more than ever before, these, these people really do need to have some medical intervention and some uh, major help. Anyway, my, my second question, uh, thank you, Your Worship, is can you tell me uh, how are your firefighters and uh, your responders, you know, doing? Uh, what, you know, considering what they're witnessing on a daily basis, can you talk to us about the emotional impact on your staff and what you're going through a little bit? I just want the public to understand what, what you go through. Certainly, uh, through Your Worship, Council Perino. Um, the, the impact on first responders, uh, paramedics, firefighters, police, uh, bylaws, community safety, um, I think is extremely significant. The BC uh, municipality of, of safety has been doing some analysis on firefighters and firefighters out of the population they study. And I have to, I have to note that in that population, they don't have police and ambulance in, in it, um, but in the population that they study for uh, municipalities, um, that firefighters, the, the, the mental health claims are making up, I, I believe, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe they're approximately 65%. Um, and I believe the average cost uh, of that uh, group that they studied exceeded 200,000. So um, 
Yeah, the, the cost for for stress-related injuries um, for firefighters, certainly in BC, is uh, significant. Um, and, and you're right, we do experience it with our, our staff and we're doing running a number of programs to support the staff um, between our, um, our staff, our management team, working collaboratively with the union. We have uh, cr critical incident stress team debriefings. Um, we have counselors, we have, we've enhanced our, our, our benefits in, in psychological. So we're really, uh, we're really looking at a, a holistic approach, physical fitness and yeah. everything, um, just trying to create and trying to create a good work environment so that, um, you know, people feel supported when they are at work doing these, this really challenging work. Well, I, I just want to say thank you so much. You're an inspiration and, uh, we just we couldn't do without you in the city. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Prino. Councillor Thorpe, please. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I have two quick questions uh, through you, if I may, to the Chief. Thanks, Chief Doyle. It's, uh, it's a discouraging report, but uh, valuable information. My first question is, with this trend that you have pointed out, the alarming increase in uh, overdose uh, uh, incidents, and I'm wondering about your staff's ability to respond to this increasing number of calls that eventually is going to i think impede potentially your ability to respond to other emergencies that uh, come in because i know it's a very busy job at the best of times or the worst of times mm -hmm. and this is really going to start to impact your ability to protect our community could you just comment on that certainly through your worship Councillor Thorpe, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so in our master plan, uh, now this, it's trailing data and it doesn't include um, 21, 22, or 23. You may ask why our, you know, the data I included was the most recent years. It's because they, they are the largest years and it's where the trend, uh, you know, appears to be going. Um, so we, like in 2017, we we're just over 9,000 total incidents. and. And then in 2018, because of the critical response model, we dropped a little bit to approximately 8,000, then 7,000 in 2019. And, and then through COVID, it really it, it dropped. And then it starts to pick up again in 21, 22, 23, kind of. So that's why, uh, first off, uh, that's why the, the, the most recent data, because it, it encapsulates the, you know, the current situation. In terms, so the data I'm about to tell you is, is from our master plan that has some of those um, leaner years. But in those years, we are concurrent calls, so the time that we respond to concurrent calls. Now, that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean necessarily an overdose in a fire or an overdose in an MBI or an overdose in a, um, a technical rescue or hazmat call. It's just two calls occurring at the same time is about 20% um, of the time. So, I, and we are working to update our master plan, so we'll have better data, you know, moving forward with these numbers coming in. But um, so yeah, about 20% of the time we're doing concurrent calls. Now, where that comes into an impact, especially when we had four apparatus, four engines staff before council approved the master plan, hiring the t uh, staffing up the new engine, which we just did, um, and then staffing up another engine for next year is that when we go to even, a, so when, you, when we're thinking of responding to fire calls, uh, NFPA 1710 provides a model, model to do that. It's the best practices, it's, it's based on um, the best practices, science, evidence, all those kinds, the fire growth. And that calls for, with, with, a, with a ladder truck, if we say that all these, because there's a caveat, if it doesn't have a ladder truck, then it's 16. But with the ladder truck, it calls for 17 people there at low. So that would be a single family home on fire. It takes approximately 17 people, but well, it takes 17 people. That's what they recommend in 1710. So when we only had 16 people on four engines and we had two engines tied up at lower acuity incidents, or um, it meant that we had less resources available to respond to um, two structure fires and other incidents that require more resources. And it's not just structure fires that require more resources, hazmat calls, um, wildfires, which we are all, uh, you know, most communities are, are very concerned about and, and um, uh, technical rescue calls, all those calls require, you can't do them with a single engine generally. Um, 
So yeah, it is a concern when we're at stuck or um, when we've responded to, when we're on an incident, because remember we can't break <coughs> in contact and then another big incident comes in. So that is, that is a concern. But with our master plan, we have strengthened our ability to respond to current concurrent calls. So when we have five engines on right now, if, if, they're, if they are stuck, if one engine's stuck at the call, then we do have four engines still left to respond. Um, and likewise, when we staff up again in 2025 to manage all call types and concurrent calls, that will strengthen our ability to manage concurrent calls. But to your point, it is definitely a concern when, um, as, as we can see this trend growing with uh, you know, illicit drug uh, overdoses. So, and when we look at our calls going from approximately 10,000 to 12,000, and it's looking like uh, over a thousand of those calls. So if we grow by 2,000 calls and over a thousand of them are gonna be in overdoses alone. So it, it's definitely a concern. Thank you. Um, and I, I should add, people ask the fire department um, in terms of uh, like for some of the more granular data, I just like to remind everyone that we, when we respond to calls, we're at the call to help someone in a life safety issue. So some of the granular data, the, the best place to find that's in the healthcare system, because we get them, our, our, role, our job is to get them stabilized in the ambulance with the crews and on the way to the, to the, the hospital where they can collect more of that data, ask more questions. And um, so that is probably the, the most, uh, comprehensive area to get the data from, so. Thank you, Your Worship. And if I may, uh, my second question, Chief Doyle, through uh, His Worship is, um, obviously, I think obviously the city appreciates very highly the, the work that Nanaimo Fire Rescue does. And we have, uh, as you well know, recently approved the hiring of uh, new firefighters and new equipment. But what we're, what we're looking for here is a change in the provincial funding model. And I'm wondering what realistically can this council do to support you uh, in that uh, request? Uh, acknowledging that two resolutions have already gone forward to UBCM, as you've pointed out, with no response. Uh, do we just keep trying that? Are there other options? What can we do to show our support for what your uh, obvious need is? Through your worship, to Councillor Thorpe. I think we could prepare another resolution for UBCM next year. I think we could, I know with um, some other city objectives that we're going through right now we, that we're writing letters to the province to solicit support. Um, in terms of uh, what local governments are able to do, I think those are the two most common um, approaches. So to solicit support, support for a funding model, support fire departments in general, not just in Iowa Fire Rescue, fire departments uh, in BC for support. Thank you, Chief, and the data that you're supplying us would be very valuable in, in uh, putting together those resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Brown. Thank you. I was just going to say, and there, there is one other option which isn't going to be palatable to a lot of people, is that we just instruct them not to go because there's nothing in law that says they need to respond. That was, that's an option that other communities are looking at right now. So, but is that not true, Chief? There's nothing that says you must respond to medical calls. Through uh, your worship to Councillor Armstrong, uh, Councillor Armstrong's correct. It is it is a provincial responsibility, clearly. Um, in the Emergency um, Health Services Act, I think it's under Section 5, or uh, I think it's under Section 5 anyways, I have it here. Um, and it states that it's a provincial responsibility to provide in British Columbia ambulance service and emergency health services. So I think that's it's pretty clearly stated in there. I think that the part that... Um, often gets missed in that is that the fire departments, including ours across BC, have been embedded in the pre-hospital care system. So there's, and I think the other concern, or not concern, but consideration, um, well, I think that's the main consideration is that we're all, we're deeply embedded in the um, pre-hospital care system. So I think the outcomes for uh, the patients would could be significantly compromised in terms of um, patient outcomes, uh, you know, if they don't get timely care. And, um, you know, as, as a patient deceasing, I mean, we, um, we often go to patients that don't make it as well. And, and we are, um, you know, we, and we often do save patients. So 
and that's a team effort between us and the BC Ambulance Services right now. So I just think it's another point where we can show there's more provincial downloading that we never even think about, and now it's just become normal for us to do it. And I'm not suggesting by any means that we don't do it. I'm just saying that it is an option. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Please. Thank, thank you, Worship. I, I think interesting line of questions. It's also a bit discussion, and you know. I'm not sure it's downloading when communities opted in and the province only ever provided a base level of service. So I think there's an interesting discussion there. But the one question I do have is contextualizing advocacy, you know, in, 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 in particular around the BC Fire Service. Would this be the best thing to be advocating for? Um, so I, I, you know, I wonder, you know, when it comes to funding and the costs that growth, you know, undoubtedly has on a whole host of services, but including the need for new apparatus, um, the need for new fire halls, is if you know, you're always limited in your sort of advocacy points. Um, if if this would be the best place to spend them, or is there other places that have been looked at by, you know, you know, the Association of Chiefs or IAFF around, you know, development cost charges for fire halls or you know, I know there's a lot of work on healthcare and, and the items there. So I'm just curious when it comes to all the things that need to be advocated on, would this be something that you would suggest is a prime focus? Through your worship to Councillor Brown. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a complex question. I think, I think clearly one, one area of focus that probably would have uh, maybe a greater impact it would be the wildfires. I mean, we see across the province the devastating impacts year in and year out for wildfires, staffing. So I think there's, um, there's some work to do there. And we see it year over year. We, you know, it's, um, it seems like, uh, you know, whether you believe in, you know, with the climate is, is changing and it seems like it, our summers are changing as a result of that. And we're having longer, more intense fire seasons. So. Um, I think that's an area of advocacy, you know, that, that's important. But in terms of, like, uh, the medical incident, it all depends how you break it down. I mean, when you're looking at the cost for service, and when you, and when you look in the report, it's if we turned off all our medical calls, that would have, you know, that's approximately just over $150,000 in, in wages, in, or sorry, $150,000 in medical uh, first responder supplies, fuel, um, and the like. Now... So it, yeah, so is there is there greater areas that we could advocate for that would save us more than one hundred and fifty three thousand dollars if we turned off all our medical calls? I think there def, there certainly is, um, and I, so I and, or it depends on if they were if the funding model included wages in that. So because if we look at that, so if if the new funding model included the cost of wages, are we have data that shows us the amount of time we spend on these incidents and. In our case, in this report for that year, 2022, is about 12 minutes, just over 12 minutes. So if you include that cost, it's just under $600,000. So now, to our community, that's a larger sum of money. So it all it would all depend on the provincial model, if the province um, created a model, what that looked like, what that framework looked like, and what they were willing to reimburse us for. So without knowing what the model the province created would, I don't know how um, how much benefit there would be to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other questions. Chief Doyle, thank you to you, your team, for all the work you do day in, day out. We know it's challenging. Thank you. Uh, the next item is Development Variance Permit Application Number DVP 456-113 Pirates Lane. Mr. Holm, good evening, welcome. Uh, thank you, Your Worship and uh, Council. Uh, this is a uh, relatively minor uh, height variance uh, for a property on um, uh, Protection Island, Pirates Lane, and uh, the uh, notification for the development variance uh, permit has been uh, uh, issued. Uh, it's taken place. Um, the proposal is uh, an addition to an existing dwelling and a height variance uh, from 7 to 7.73 meters. I'm happy to take any questions on that. Thank you. Moved by Council. Uh, pardon me. First, is anyone here wishes to speak with respect to DVP 456-113 Pirates Lane? 
Not seeing anyone, Councillor Thorpe moved the recommendation. Councillor Brown is seconding. No discussion that I can see. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? None, contrary, no contrary, thank you. Motion carries. The next is development permit number DP1277-1588, Boundary Crescent. Mr. Holm, again, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is a significant um, improvement uh, to property in the uh, hospital area. Um, the property is on the corner of Dufferin and Boundary. Uh, you can see outlined in red. Um, if you could bring up um, the building uh, perspectives on attachment E, it'll show, I'll, uh, give you an uh, overview of what the pro proposal looks like. Um, proposal is by RW Wall uh, Limited uh, for a five-story mixed-use building, um, very prominent location on the corner of Boundary and Dufferin. Uh, we've got um, uh, three stories uh, at, in the upper floors of um, a one-bed um, units that are in 12 one bed units that are intended for uh, use by um, interns etc uh, from uh, the hospital so a great location for that and a restaurant on the main floor and uh, mezzanine sort of uh, one and two story uh, restaurant uh, as part of the mixed use component a couple of variances minor variances to um, landscape buffer and uh, a variance to the number of loading spaces are proposed uh, attachment f shows the landscape plan it gives you a sense of how the site is being developed um, it's it, the location of an existing uh, vacant building and uh, yeah quite a prominent uh, location there an improvement uh, in the in the hospital area um, happy to take questions thank you thank you very much not seeing uh, councillor Prino. Sorry, Your Worship. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a question. Um, I, I, I want to say, first of all, I think this is fantastic. That area I know very well. And it's the, the buildings that are currently there are very tired. So this, uh, this is a real thrill to see this. So I'm just, I'm wondering about the parking situation, uh, uh, what is happening here. And um, um, because there is, you talked about, I'm just wondering if you could go through that because there is a paragraph about it, but I'm just wondering if you could explain it a bit more. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, through your worship. Great question. Um, I'm not sure how much of the uh, detail you'd like me to get into, but I can, I'm can. i happy to cover that. So um, uh, the uh, yeah, parking obviously is limited on the site, but there is a, an adjacent building, uh, if okay. I'm trying to remember the address of uh, an adjacent property that is actually uh, a mixed use uh, medical office some retail uh, in the lower floor where the uh, drip coffee and a pharmacy, uh, a pharmacy are. Um, there's a significant um, parking structure in behind that building. And uh, part of the um, uh, proposal here is to uh, secure some of that uh, parking uh, to okay. complement the required parking for, uh, for this development. Uh, and that's provided for, that opportunity is actually provided for within the parking bylaw. Um, so they can secure uh, required parking offsite uh, which is what they're proposing to do in the adjacent um, uh, parking structure on the property next door. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that because that is uh, there is a lot of parking in the building there. So I just wasn't sure exactly if that was going to be part of the plan. And will this be a phased-in approach? Should this go forward tonight? I'm sorry. The building, the building of it, will be a phased-in project because there's some um, considerable office space and a lab and that kind of thing that will be affected. Uh, yeah, through your worship. So this, uh, the intention here is to uh, just develop on the corner. Um, the existing uh, vacant building there would be um, uh, demolished and, and uh, redeveloped in this five-story form. Uh, the existing offices um, to the uh, um, in the gray, I guess, on the on the sc uh, screen overhead would would remain. Uh, there's still development, additional development potential on the property, but uh, this is uh, yeah the first phase of of redevelopment for sure. Thrilled to see it. Thank you so much, Your Worship. I'll certainly be supporting this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If someone moved the motion, we can support it. Moved Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Eastmere. Any discussion, Councillor? Uh, no. This is Boundary Crescent. All those in favor, any opposed, none, motion carries, thank you. 
Uh, the next is development permit application number DP1300-3612 Island Highway North. Mr. Holm again, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This uh, property is in the um, uh, the uh, Long Lake area, uh, Long Lake neighborhood. It's uh, the existing Nissan dealership, so just, uh, I guess, north or west of uh, Country Club Mall. You see it outlined in red. Um, redeveloping uh, the existing property uh, with a new uh, car dealership. Um, and if you could bring up um, attachment E, I think it'll uh, identify the, the building renderings, give you an idea of how the uh, the redevelopment will uh, will look there. There's the new building outlined there. And attachment F uh, shows the landscape plan, generally how the uh, the site will be developed. Um, so it's at the uh, corner of Island Highway and 107th, uh, the existing uh, Nissan dealership. Um, the building and site design are supported by a, a strong uh, uh, landscape plan. Uh, the proposal went to the uh, design advisory panel in, in July um, and again uh, returned in September uh, with uh, a number of recommendations uh, to be addressed. Um, subsequently, work was done on the proposal to, uh, to address the, the um, uh, design panel's comments and to better align with the um, development permit area guidelines. There are a couple of variances proposed uh, to uh, reduce the maximum front yard setback, uh, reduce uh, or to allow uh, for parking within the front yard, uh, which typically isn't allowed between the front face of the building and the street, and to, um, uh, in, I guess, increase the minimum uh, building height. Um, typically, two stories uh, are required. Uh, what's proposed here is one story, although it appears to be to uh, by massing and, and there is a mezzanine uh, within the uh, um, within the building. Uh, this is substantially consistent with uh, uh, other proposals and, and the variances that are typically requested for uh, car dealerships uh, of similar um, design and, and uh, uh, most currently um, brought forward to council. Um, happy to take any questions on that. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Holm. Not seeing any questions for Mr. Holmes, someone care to move the recommended motion? Moved Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Eastmere. No, actually, sorry, sorry. I actually Eastmere. did have a question. Yeah. Um, through you uh, to staff, thank you. Um, just having been present at the design advisory panel meetings and seeing the amount of feedback that came back, just kind of wondering if you can walk me through how, um, how it happens when the design advisory panel is asked that it come back and, and staff, how did they get to the decision that it largely meets um, the city bylaw and design guidelines? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, through your worship, uh, thank you uh, to Councillor Eastmere. Uh, good question. So this um, unusually returned twice to design, well not, applications do return twice uh, on occasion to design panel. In this case, the design panel wanted the application to return a third time. Uh, the developer uh, requested that it uh, it proceed to council. Uh, they did um, they did make revisions to to address um, comments of the design panel, uh, but they wanted to uh, proceed directly to council. Um, some of the the uh, re revisions that they made were increasing the glazing, so larger windows, increasing uh, uh, contrast and and texture on the building, um, improving outdoor seating. Uh, and uh, amenity areas, uh, reducing the number of surface parking stalls, uh, improving the landscape plan overall, strengthening the landscape plan, and uh, enhancing uh, pedestrian connectivity on the site and to the adjacent street, which were some of the items that uh, the design panel picked up on. Uh, but um, in order to move the application along uh, more quickly, uh, they requested that uh, the uh, they bring these revisions forward directly to council. Staff have reviewed them and, and are supportive that they're uh, compliant with the general design guidelines. Okay, appreciate that insight and uh, also appreciate the work of the design panel, which I think uh, made some really good recommendations that did end up um, being included in the final design. And I'm optimistic that maybe the point about uh, adding a significant landscaping landscaping feature on one of the property corners might still come to fruition as, as the design moves forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All those in favor? Those opposed? Councillor Eastmere, motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is development permit application number DP1305-4745 Ledgerfoot Road. Mr. Holm again, please. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is uh, an application um, for development that council will be familiar with. It's a 120 unit um, uh, apartment uh, completed in, or it's two buildings, uh, completed in uh, 2022. Quite a steeply sloping site. A uh, number of retaining walls were required um, upon uh, final survey. Uh, confirmation of the retaining wall height uh, variances. It was identified that the walls were over height and variances were required. Um, there are um, uh, attachment uh, D shows the uh, landscape plan with uh, the location of the variances. And, uh, and then there's some context photos on attachment E that will help uh, uh, walk through. So you can see in blue there, um, sorry, if you back up one, thank you. Um, you can see in blue the uh, walls in question there and then thank you. And if you advance to the photos, you can see the, uh, the walls that are um, mostly internal to the site uh, are over height and, and require variances. Again, a steeply sloping site. It, it has been complete and it's occupied um, and they require uh, variances to address over height uh, uh, retaining walls, which include uh, the height of the guardrail that you can see above. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Hong? Not seeing anyone, someone care to move the motion? Moved Councillor Armstrong, seconded Councillor Brown. Any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. The next is rezoning application RA843 2265 Ashley Road. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, relatively uh, minor uh, rezoning application. This is on Ashley Road between Twiggly Wiggly and uh, Dawkins Lane. Um, the existing property has a, a dwelling unit off to the, uh, the east side of the property. Um, and looking to rezone uh, the portion uh, um, to the west of that for a duplex. Uh, so the idea is to, to rezone to support a, a duplex in conjunction with a subdivision. Um, a pretty straightforward application. Um, there's a concept subdivision uh, plan attached as attachment B. Just to give you an idea of what's proposed, uh, you can see the existing house cited there. Um, and uh, the area, it's identified uh, as lot 42. Um, you can see the dashed line where the future subdivision would likely occur. I'm happy to take any questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Brown. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, through to staff, and maybe this question can't be answered, um, but obviously there's community amenity contributions that are secured and things are potentially secured if it advances. What happens or do we know what happens to that kind of, those in-stream applications if the zoning just generally changes? You know, it's not, the zoning's not required, or rezoning isn't required on a site-specific basis, but it's in-stream. Uh, thank you, through Your Worship. I believe, so Councillor Brown, you're speaking to the uh, provincial, proposed provincial um, legislative changes? Yes. And the impact on this? Um, yeah, it's um, specifically to the community amenity contribution proposal or just the, the application in general? I can speak in general terms. I, I was more interested in actually, like, you know, our, are we potentially moving to secure things that were just, like, it, you know, is it a, one, an unfair burden to this individual application um, that others aren't, you know, like, there's going to be some that seem to be caught in this in between. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, um, it's interesting the changes were announced uh, uh, Wednesday uh, last week, November 1st. Um, we're not, we're obviously still um, digesting uh, the impact. Uh, there's uh, limited information because uh, there's a set of um, uh, accompanying regulations, supporting regulations. We understand that would be uh, um, announced in December along with a policy manual that would give uh, more clarity and guidance on on uh, the details and the, the implications. Um, it, it could be in this case that the, um, uh, the applicant may decide to hold. Um, so if, if the, if the bylaws passed um, first and second today and proceeds to public hearing, uh, are there further steps, third reading, and then followed by adoption. So typically in a bylaw after third reading, um, conditions uh, are, are addressed um, prior to bringing the bylaw back for adoption. So it could be that the applicant uh, 
chooses to, to hold and see prior to completing on the conditions. Um, if the uh, provincial regulations go ahead, or the, the legislative changes goes, go ahead as proposed, um, a, a simple subdivision without rezoning uh, could potentially see four units um, on, on that, that same land area. Um, so yeah, good questions. Okay. Uh, don't have crystal clarity on that, but um, it's kind of a wait and see. So. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Councilor Smear. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500.217 <clears throat> to rezone 2265 Ashley Road from single dwelling residential R1A to duplex residential R4 pass first reading. Seconded Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Councillor Eastmere. Motion that zoning amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500.217 pass second reading and Council direct staff to secure the conditions related to zoning am amendment bylaw 2023 number 4500.217 as outlined in the conditions of rezoning section of the staff report dated 2023 November 6th should council support the bylaw at third reading. Thank you, seconded. Councillor Thorpe, any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed, none, motion carries, thank you. We're on to bylaws now. Uh, a, highway closure dedication removal of Melidio Road and a portion of Old Victoria Road bylaw 2023 number 7367. Councillor Eastmere. Motion that highway closure and dedication removal bylaw 2023 number 7367 to provide for highway closure and dedication removal of a portion of Melito Melodio Road and a portion of Old Victoria Road adjacent to 1044 and 1048 Old Victoria Road past third reading. Seconded Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. 13B, Harewood Centennial Turf Fields Reserve Fund Bylaw 2023, number 7369. Councillor Eastmere. Motion that Harewood Centennial Turf Fields Reserve Fund Bylaw 2023, number 7369, to establish a Harewood Centennial Turf Fields Reserve Fund be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Thorpe. All those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Brown. Consistency is always good, Councillor Brown. Motion carries. Uh, 13C, Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 4500, decimal 209. Councillor Eastmeer. Motion that Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 4500.209, to rezone 355 Nickel Street with site specific density and height provisions within the Community Service 1 CS1 zone be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. 13D, Highway Closure and Dedication Removal Bylaw 2023, number 7364. Councillor Eastmere. Motion that Highway Closure and Dedication Re Removal Bylaw 2023, number 7364, a bylaw to provide for highway closure and dedication removal of an unnamed laneway between 334 and 364 Halliburton Street be adopted. Seconded, Councillor Armstrong. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. We have no notice of motion with respect to other business, Ms. Geary, however, there are the letters of recommendation. Councillor Brown, you wanted to speak to this, and please? Your Worship, oh, just Geary, before you, sorry. Just, there is the one additional letter of support that I added during late items from the Woodgrove Senior Citizens Housing Society. They as well are asking for a letter of support for an upcoming project um, on um, near the hospital on Seafield Crescent. So they are also seeking a letter of support for that proposal as well. So there's the, the three. Three. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I would move that letters of support be provided to the Woodgrove Seniors Housing Society, Pacifica Housing, and Bolinas Housing Society uh, for their respective projects. Seconded, Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, any discussion, anyone? I'm, uh, I must say, before we, we vote, and I assume it's going to be unanimous, it's wonderful to see so many organizations stepping forward in the community uh, prepared to take on the housing project. So uh, well done to all of them. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Question period, Ms. Geary? Nothing for question period. Motion to adjourn. Move, Councillor Brown. Second to Councillor Eastmere. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Work of staff as usual. Well done.